Hello, welcome once again. We are going to have a look at soil and water contamination, the risks and remediation strategies. So, this will be our outline, objectives, background soil, you look at water, then what is a contaminant? You look at water contamination, soil contamination, sources of contaminants, types of soil and water contaminants, risks, remediation strategies, then we will look at some proven cases, real lifetime scenarios. Then we conclude. Objectives. To know the meaning of contaminants and examples of contaminants. Also to know the meaning of soil contamination and to know the meaning of water contamination. Also to know the risks posed by soil and water contamination. To know some remediation strategies applied in water and soil contamination background sustainable development in any society is an access to initiate a good standard of living for the populace it aims at providing solutions to the economic environmental and societal challenges without posing a threat the human and environmental future development that is we must consider the future as we make present decisions industrialization in any society is a major initiator of development and urbanization although the merits of industrialization are innumerable it has been identified as a major threat to the environment why? Because it releases various toxic chemicals, gases, solid waste, as well as microbes of various kinds into our immediate environment. That's land, air, and water. So cleaning up contamination at installations that were part of the former nuclear weapons production complex is the most costly environmental restoration project in the United States history. Now, the Department of Energy, which is responsible for these installations, has spent between 5.6 billion US dollars and 7.2 billion dollars per year on environmental management over the past several years. Contaminated sites are always a public concern for its potential damage to living organisms, including human beings, the ecology, the environment, and even property value. Soil. We say soil is the thin layer of organic and inorganic materials that covers the earth's rocky surface. The organic portion, which is derived from the decayed remains of plants and animals, is concentrated in the dark uppermost topsoil. The inorganic portion, made up of rock fragments, was formed over thousands of years by physical and chemical weathering of bedrock. Soil is a balanced and complex system where plants and microbes live and cooperate, thus ensuring crops and food necessary to sustain life. Water. Water is an essential and genuine need of life with an undeniable effect directly or indirectly. Three quarters of the fluid in man is made of water and it forms the essential medium in which the biochemical reactions take place in human body. Water is a good solvent, and it is usually referred to as universal solvent. All the major components in cells, that is protein, DNA, and polysaccharides are all soluble in water. All industrial, environmental, and metabolic processes are water dependent. In living organisms, Water plays a number of roles such as solvent, temperature buffer, metabolite, living environment, and lubricants. 
any natural water contains dissolved chemicals, some of which are important human nutrients, while others can be harmful to human health. What is a contaminant? A contaminant is any potentially undesirable substance, physical, chemical, or biological. Contamination is the presence of a constituent, impurity, or some other undesirable element that spoils, corrupts, infects, makes unfit, or makes inferior a material, physical body, natural environment, workplace. In environmental chemistry, the term contamination is in some cases virtually equivalent to pollution, where the main interest is the harm done on a large scale to human organisms or environments. An environmental contaminant may be chemical in nature, though it may also be a biological, that's pathogenic bacteria, virus, invasive species, or physical energy agent. The global water crisis involves water contamination. Water is said to be contaminated when some of the water quality parameters have been hampered by unguided and irregularities from several anthropogenic activities or man activities, thus rendering water unfit for, un for intended use. For water to be useful for drinking and irrigation, it must not be contaminated beyond certain thresholds. Water contamination has become a global challenge. Developing nations being highly affected due to their drive for development. According to the World Health Organization in 2008, approximately 880 million people in the world, or 13% of the entire world population, they did not have access to safe drinking water. Contaminants in rivers may simply move to another reservoir, such as the ocean, where it can cause further problems. Groundwater is typically characterized by slow flow and longer residence time, which can make groundwater contamination particularly problematic. So, this is a picture of a river in Ghana called River Ankubra. And this picture was taken on the 20th of February 2016. But due to the activities of man, illegal mining, this is the state of this particular river, just a year and some few months after. You can see the clear difference. Soil contamination. The basis of agriculture is soil. All crops for human food and animal feed depend upon it. Indeed, with rapid population growth across the world, the food demand for consumption has drastically increased and traditional ways of producing food cannot meet with the actual demand. We are losing this important natural resource by the enormous quantities of man-made waste products, sludge and other products from new waste treatment plants, even contaminated water are also causing or leading to soil contamination. Contaminants can exist in different chemical states and different forms in the subsurface. Majority of the soil contaminants are indirectly ingested via the food chain. In order to preserve the fertility and the productivity of the soil, control measures are to be taken in a herculean manner, thereby improving the health of all living beings. So you can see soil contamination from this picture. Sources of contamination, or sources of contaminants, sorry. Now we can classify them into various categories. 
and with our first classification we can have point sources of contaminants or contamination what are point sources of contamination this is readily identifiable in relatively small locations and it includes animal factory farm that raise a large number of high density of livestock such as cows pigs and chickens also pipe from factories or sewage treatment plants during heavy rain storm water runoff may exceed sewer capacity causing it to back up and spilling on treated seaweed directly into surface waters if a single identifiable source can be located then the pollutant originated from a point source non-point sources these are large and more diffuse areas include agricultural fields industry cities and abandoned mines rainfall runs over the land and through the ground picking up contaminants such as herbicides pesticides and fertilizer from agricultural fields and lawns oil antifreeze animal waste and road salt from urban areas and acid and toxic elements from abandoned mines this contaminant is carried into surface water bodies and groundwater. Non-point source of contamination is usually much more difficult and expensive to control than point source pollution because of its low concentration and multiple sources. So this is how the point source looks like. You can see this is coming from a single source but then if you look at the non-point source most it's coming from multiple sources and this is a field as you can see sources of contaminants once again we can also classify it into agricultural sources and non-agricultural sources so we are, we've already talked about the, about the first classification that's the point source and non-point source and this is our second classification of sources of contaminants our second classification is either agricultural sources or non-agric sources so agricultural sources these come from different sources including agriculture and animal husbandry some of the agricultural practices lead to contamination animal waste use of long lived pesticides herbicide fungicides nematocytes fertilizers these are all agricultural practices that lead to contamination non agric sources so contamination by non agricultural sources is usually the direct result of urban sprawl caused by rapidly increasing population and then and a rapidly per capita output of waste related to our modern way of life some materials that find their entry into the soil system have long persistence and accumulate in toxic concentration and thus become sources of pollution some of those most important soil pollutants are inorganic toxic compounds so types of soil and water contamination we have oxygen demanding waste pathogenic microorganisms heavy metals radionuclides dense non-aqueous phase liquids and hazardous chemicals and persistent organic pollutants oxygen demanding waste Oxygen demanding waste is an extremely important contaminant to ecosystems. Most surface water in contact with the atmosphere has a small amount of dissolved oxygen, which is needed by aquatic organisms for cellular respiration or aerobic respiration. 
bacteria decompose dead organic matter and remove dissolved oxygen according to the following reaction organic matter plus oxygen then the pipe products are carbon dioxide and water so this is aerobic respiration so these bacteria use the oxygen for this aerobic respiration too much decaying organic matter in water is a contaminant because it removes oxygen from water and this oxygen is what is used in the aerobic respiration and by removing this oxygen aquatic organisms are affected because they also need oxygen to survive the major source of dead organic matter in many natural waters is sewage and grass and leaves are smaller sources pathogenic microbes pathogens are disease causing microbes examples viruses bacteria parasitic worms and protozoa pathogens cause a variety of intestinal diseases such as dysentery typhoid fever and cholera now pathogens are the major cause of the water pollution crisis unfortunately nearly a billion people around the world are exposed to waterborne pathogen pollution daily and around 1.5 million children mainly in underdeveloped countries die every year of waterborne diseases from pathogens pathogens enter water primarily from human and animal fecal waste due to inadequate sewage treatment in many underdeveloped countries sewage is discharged into local waters either untreated or after only rudimentary treatment in developed countries untreated sewage discharge can occur from overflows of combined sewer systems poorly managed livestock factory farms and leaky or broken sewage collection systems water with pathogens can be remediated by adding chlorine or ozone by boiling or by treating the sewage in the first place there is increasing recognition that many groundwater supplies have microbial contamination yet the use of untreated groundwater continues in many small communities and by individual homeowners heavy metal soil is a dynamic natural resource for the survival of human life and due to its complex matrix is the principal receiver of the persistent contaminants such as heavy metals heavy metals mostly find specific absorption sites in the soil where they are retained very strongly either on the inorganic or organic colloids heavy metal contamination of soils concerns several scientists because of the potential toxicity of metals anthropogenic actions related to industrialization are central sources of heavy metals to soils human activities that add waste material to the soils also influence its metal concentration heavy metals accumulation in soils sediments and their subsequent release to ground or surface water poses an environmental threat metal contaminants are generally non-degradable so treatment technologies must involve some form of mobilization of the contaminant as in order to move it to a location where it can be treated or immobilization in order to stabilize it in place and prevent further spreading lead mercury arsenic cadmium copper vanadium and chromium can accumulate through the food chain these are all heavy metals heavy metals are commonly produced by industry and at metallic ore mines the problem of heavy metal contamination of surface and groundwater is more severe in developing countries due to the inadequate and non-continuous monitoring 
of these water resources. In Ghana, the problem is even more heightened as a result of the scattered large-scale mining and illegal small-scale mining activities. Radionuclides. Radionuclides are types of atoms that are radioactive. The most common radionuclides in drinking water are radium, radon, and uranium. Most of the radionuclides in drinking water occur naturally at very low levels and are not considered a public health concern. However, radionuclides can also be discharged into drinking water from human activities, such as from active nuclear power plants or other facilities that make or use radioactive substances. Radionuclides have multiple possible oxidation states with different mobility, can partition to organic matter present in soil, can sorb to other soil components, and can precipitate. All of these factors can affect the performance of remediation technologies. Radionuclide contaminants are generally non-degradable, so treatment technologies must involve some form of mobilization of the contaminant or immobilization. Dense non aqueous phase liquids. These are oily liquids that are denser than water. They are chemicals or mixtures of chemicals that have two major characteristics in common. One, they are heavier than water. Two, they are only slightly soluble in water. These two physical characteristics mean that when released into the environment in sufficient quantity, they can move through soils and groundwater until they encounter a sufficiently resistant layer that will impede further mass vertical movement and allow the liquid to pool. It tests halogenated alkenes. Halogenated alkenes. Halogenated monoaromatics. Polychlorinated biphenyls, multi component waste. These are all examples of dense non aqueous phase liquids. Hazardous chemicals and persistent organic contaminants. Persistent organic pollutants are long lived in the environment, biomagnified through the food chain, and can be toxic. Pesticides may exert harmful effects to microbes. As a result of which plant growth may be affected. Pesticides which are not rapidly decomposed may create such problems. Accumulation of residues of pesticides in higher concentrations are toxic. Pesticide persistence in soil and movement into water streams may also lead to their entry into foods and create health hazards. DDT, diosin, which is a byproduct of herbicide, and PCBs, that's polychlorinated biphenyls. So these are examples of hazardous chemicals and persistent organic contaminants. Then let's look at risk. Risk can be defined as a likelihood of an undesired event occurring under a specific event or period. Risk assessments serve to inform and support decision making in matters of risk. The process of risk assessment involves determining the likelihood and severity of different adverse impacts given exposure of a, uh, of a population to a, a hazard. Risk analysis includes the process of risk assessment as well as risk management activities to decide what an acceptable risk level is and to take actions to reduce the risk. The risk assessment and management of soil contamination is usually performed by 
regular monitoring of different soil parameters at specific sampling sites by forming a sampling net for a certain region of interest. Risk assessment requires the activities of hazard identification, exposure assessment, and dose response or exposure response assessment. Now, hazard identification is a determination of what adverse agents might be present and what adverse impacts they might cause. Also, exposure assessment, as is the quantitative determination of the levels of contaminants. In the case of environmental exposures, individuals may consume, inhale, contact over a specific time period. Those response assessment is the quantitative determination of the likelihood of an individual having a particular adverse effect from a given exposure. Alternatively, this can be viewed as the proportion of persons in the population who are expected to have the adverse effect where sorry, who are expected to have the adverse effect where they have the particular exposure. Quantitative methods of risk assessment are used to obtain numerical values for risk. A quantitative assessment is advantageous in that it enables risk to be compared to one another and is useful to analyze complex systems. Qualitative methods of risk assessment describe the risks using words or classes. Qualitative methods that add a numerical component to the probability are usually referred to as semi-quantitative. There is an increasing use of risk-oriented policies to deal with the local effects of contamination. The risks that such policies deal with are human risk, human health risk, and can also include ecological risk. So ecological risk. Ecological risk assessment is often a complex process with many variables to take into account. Ecological risk assessment involves many stakeholders and all have to be dealt with in a clear and consistent way. A stepwise approach is therefore useful to overcome the complexity of an ecological risk assessment. In order to structure all the information collected, a decision support system can be used. Each step will lead to a decision to proceed or to stop. So the decision support system, DSS, is separated in, in three different stages. Stage 1 is the site characterization and description of land use. Stage 2, determination of ecological aspects. And stage 3, site specific assessment. And when you come to the stage 3, we have the tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4. So, site characterization. It aims at involving as many stakeholders as possible in order to describe site characteristics and to review all available information from the site. Example, historical information about land use. Investigation of whether the site may be regulated under specific directives. Obvious data gaps and agency for reaction and data collection. The spatial borders of the site should be defined, and the current and the future land use have to be defined. Consultation between administrators, planners, and experts, therefore, has to take place as early as possible in the process. Determination of ecological aspects. Site-specific ecological features and receptors relating to the land use defined in Stage 1 need to be outlined. This includes aspects like key species and life support functions. 
the potential ecological receptors should be identified in order to determine whether potential source pathway receptor linkages can be established. This includes not only ecological receptors directly linked to the site, but also those linked indirectly, example, through leaching of contaminants to connected freshwater systems, or migrating bears or mammals feeding in the area. Experts from ecotoxicology and ecology should be involved in the selection of ecological aspects. Site-specific tiered assessment. If after finalizing stage 1 and stage 2, it is still considered that there is a need for a site-specific evaluation of ecological risk, the process continues to the stage 3. Soil contamination can lead to 1. Reduced soil fertility, that soil becomes unavailable to grow food. 2. Reduce nitrogen fixation. Increase erodibility. A lack of plants on the soil will cause more erosion. Larger loss of soil and nutrients. Imbalance in the soil fauna and flora. So the pollutants will change the makeup of the soil and the types of microbes that will live in it. Bioavailable metals present in the soil may be absorbed by plants, resulting in serious plant metabolism dysfunctioning. High heavy metal ion concentrations are also known to damage the cell membrane, affect enzymes involved in chlorophyll production, thus reducing photosynthetic rate, as well as affect plant reproduction via decrease in pollen and seed viability. Many physiological disorders may accompany crustaceans, exposure to metals, and instant metabolic activities alterations. Exposure of crustaceans to heavy metals may also result in loss of appetite for food and subsequently body weight loss. Continuous exposure may reduce reproduction in adults as well as hamper the growth larvae. Health risk. Organic waste of various types can cause pollution hazards. So domestic garbage, municipal sewage, and industrial waste, when left in heaps or improperly disposed, seriously affect health of human beings, plants, and animals. Pollution of our water bodies poses a great threat to humans and the aquatic ecosystem. Humans and animals can be exposed to heavy metal toxicity through the food web, direct consumption of water containing metal or via inhalation. Heavy metals readily bioaccumulates in vegetables and enters into man and animal through the food chain. Effects of heavy metal toxicity on human ranges from mild eye nose and skin irritations through severe headache, stomach ache, diarrhea, hematemesis, vomiting, dizziness to organ dysfunctions such as cirrhosis, necrosis, low blood pressure, hypertension, and gastrointestinal distress. How some heavy metals also called essential elements, examples cobalt, copper, iron, manganese, vanadium, and zinc, are required in minute amount in the body for various biochemical processes. Others such as lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury are of serious threat and considered foreign in the body. So risks from drinking water. Drinking water can serve as a transmission vehicle for a variety of hazardous agents. Examples, enteric microbial pathogens from human or animal fecal contamination. Aquatic microbes that can cause harmful infections in humans. Toxins from aquatic microbes. 
several classes of chemical contaminants, organic chemicals such as benzene, polychlorinated biphenyls, and various pesticides, inorganic chemicals such as arsenic and nitrous, metals such as lead and copper, disinfection byproducts. Contaminants in drinking water can produce adverse effects in humans due to multiple rules of exposure. In addition to risk from ingestion, exposure can also occur from inhalation and dermal roots. It is known that DBPs present in drinking water may volatilize resulting in inhalation risk and these compounds and likely other organics may also be transported through the skin that after bathing or showering into the bloodstream each year approximately 1.7 million people die from diarrhea diseases associated with unsafe drinking water and almost all of these deaths are in developing countries Cadmium. So this is an element that can be considered a contaminant. And what are the sources of cadmium? Zinc smelting, mine tailings, burning coal or garbage containing cadmium, rechargeable batteries, TVs, solar cells, steel, phosphate fertilizer, metal plating, water pipes, sewage sludge. These are all sources of cadmium. Cadmium in soil or water used for irrigation can lead to accumulation in plants that enter the human food chain. Cadmium may also accumulate in animals at levels that do not affect the animal self, but can affect humans consuming animal products. Kidney, Liver and lung damage as well as bone fragility may result when cadmium is ingested. Arsenic Arsenic is a widespread metalloid in the earth's surface which can occur naturally associated with igneous and sedimentary rocks. In addition, Human activities can discharge high contents of arsenic into the environment. Due to its toxicity, arsenic is ranked on the first position in the list of priority substances compiled by the United States Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health Service. Looking at specifics, human ingestion of water polluted with arsenic can cause cancer of the lungs cancer of the liver, and also cancer of the bladder. Diozin. Diozins are a group of chemically related compounds that are persistent environmental pollutants. Human exposure to diozin and diozin-like substances occurs mainly through consumption of contaminated food mainly meat and dairy products, fish and shellfish. Diozins are highly toxic and can cause reproductive and developmental problems, damage the immune system, interfere with hormones and also cause cancer. Lead, sources of lead, batteries, soda, ammunition, pigments, paint, ceramic glaze, hair color, fishing equipment, leaded gasoline that from vehicle exhaust, mining, plumbing, coal burning, and also water pipes. Leaded fuel and mining activities are common causes for elevated lead levels in topsoil. Exposure to lead can severely damage the brain and kidneys. In children, lead exposure even at very low concentration may hamper learning, cause memory loss, affect attention and response functions, 
and generally make children aggressive. In pregnant women, high levels of exposure to lead may cause miscarriage. In men, it can damage the organs responsible for sperm production. Mercury, sources of mercury, electrical switches, fluorescent light bulbs, lamps, batteries, thermometers, mining, pesticides, medical waste, burning coal and fuel oil. Mercury is unique amidst other heavy metals. It has the capacity to travel a wide range of distance, thus have been classified as a global pollutant. Main exposure route for the population at large is via eating contaminated seafood. For children, it's direct ingestion of soil. And mercury can cause central nervous system and gastric system damage. Mercury also affects brain development, resulting in a lower IQ. Mercury affects coordination, eyesight, and sense of touch. It affects liver, heart, and can also cause damage to the kidneys. And mercury is also teratogenic in nature. It means it can cause monster babies. That's after delivery. How inhaled mercury goes into the bloodstream? Their elimination from the body is either through the urine or feces. Mercury has the ability to exist in the urine for about two months, hence their renal dysfunctioning characteristic. So we are now going to look at remediation strategies for water and then soil contamination. What are the various remediation strategies? How do we get these resources back to ship? So remediation is considered as the management of the contaminant at a site so as to prevent, minimize, or mitigate damage to human health property or the environment. Two distinct classes of remediation can be classified. The SC2 remediation and the NC2 remediation. Technologies effective for one type of contaminant, such as biodegradable components, dissolving from DNA peels, may not be effective for another type of contaminant, such as a non-biodegradable non radionuclide. So let's look at some remediation strategies for water. And the first one is pumping and treating. The conventional method for cleaning up contaminated groundwater is called pumping and treating. Pump and treat systems operate by pumping large amounts of contaminated water from the subsurface via a series of wells. Treating the water at the surface to remove contaminants and then either re injecting the water underground through a second set of wells or disposing of the water off site. However, as has now been widely documented, these systems are often ineffective in restoring contaminated groundwater to regulatory standards because the flashing action created by pump and tree systems often is not sufficient to dislodge all of the contamination from the subsurface. Small globules or DNA PL contaminants may become entrapped in the porous materials of the subsurface. Subsurface barriers. These are well established methods for preventing the spread of metal and radionuclear contaminants in groundwater. So vertical barriers are widely available. Methods are being developed for installation of horizontal barriers beneath existing waste. Permeable reactive barriers. 
This is an in situ treatment zone that passively captures a plum of contaminants and removes or breaks down the contaminants, releasing uncontaminated water. Among the most promising and rapidly developing treatment technologies for treating metals, radionuclides, and mixtures of organic and inorganic contaminants. So we are talking about these permeable reactive barriers. These barriers either intercept the flow of contaminated groundwater with a subsurface zone in which reactive materials have been installed to treat the contaminants or direct water flow through such a zone. Operation and maintenance costs are relatively low because little or no energy input is required to maintain the system. Because the technology, that the technology of permeable reactive barriers is relatively new, the longevity of reactive materials is a major uncertainty. Surfactant flooding. This is an enhanced oil recovery process in which a small amount of surfactant is added to an aqueous fluid injected to sweep the reservoir. The presence of surfactant reduces the interfacial tension between the oil and water phases and also alters the wettability of the reservoir rock to improve oil recovery. Demonstrated to effectively remove large masses of non aqueous phase liquids from salt zones in permeable aquifers. Dispersants. A dispersant or a dispersing agent is a substance, typically a surfactant, that is added to a suspension of solid or liquid particles in a liquid to improve the separation of the particles and to prevent their settling or clamping. Simply, detergents that break up oil to accelerate its decomposition. They will cause the oil slick to break up and form water-soluble micelles that are rapidly diluted. Some dispersants may be toxic to the ecosystem. Monitored natural attenuation. Monitored natural attenuation encompasses the dilution, dispersion, chemical and biological degradation, suction or precipitation, and or radioactive decay of contaminants in soil and groundwater. Monitored natural attenuation has been applied mainly to groundwater contamination. The same principles apply to soil. Because MNA is a passive process in which the reduction in contaminant concentration is due solely to natural mechanisms, continual sources of significant contamination should be addressed before implementing MNA. If monitored natural attenuation is implemented, reaching remediation goals may take longer than other remedies. So we are also going to look at some remediation strategies for soil. The first one is excavation. The conventional method for cleaning up contaminated soil is to excavate the soil and then either treat it to remove the contaminants or dispose it of in a specially designed landfill. It is applicable to practically all contaminants. Often the treatment involves incineration. The public often objects to incineration because of the perceived potential for release of hazardous air pollutants when the soil is combusted. Excavation can temporarily increase the risk of human exposure to contamination both for site workers and for nearby residents who may be exposed to fugitive dust. Excavation also destroys the native ecosystem. Plants may be unable to grow unless new topsoil is added to the site after excavation. 
Solidification and Stabilization Solidification and stabilization refer to closely related technologies that use chemical and or physical processes to treat radioactive, hazardous, and mixed waste. Solidification technologies encapsulate the waste to form a solid material. Mature technologies for SC2 immobilization of contaminated soil. The product of solidification may be a monolithic block, a clay-like material, a granular particulate, or some other physical form commonly considered solid. Stabilization technologies reduce the hazard potential of a waste by converting the contaminants into less soluble mobile or toxic forms. The physical nature and handling characteristics of the waste are not necessarily changed by stabilization. Less well developed for use in situ because of the difficulty of ensuring sufficient mixing. Improved mixing methods are being tested. Chemical oxidation. Chemical oxidation typically involves reduction or oxidation, that's redox reactions, that chemically convert hazardous contaminants to non-hazardous or less toxic compounds that are more stable, less mobile or inert. Redox reactions involve the transfer of electrons from one chemical to another. Specifically, one reactant is oxidized or loses electrons, and one is reduced or gains electrons. There are several oxidants capable of degrading contaminants. Commonly used oxidants include potassium or sodium permanganate, hydrogen peroxide, ozone, and sodium persulfate. Chemical oxidation has been proven to be effective at destruction of specific chlorinated DNAPL compounds in salt zones in permeable, relatively homogeneous soils. Bioventing Bioventing involves the ingestion of a gas into the subsurface to enhance the biodegradation of a contaminant. The gas can be used to keep the subsurface aerobic or anaerobic or to provide a substrate that enables cool metabolic degradation to occur. Aerobic bioventing has a robust track record in treating aerobically degradable contaminants such as fuels. Aerobic bioventing involves supplying oxygen to contaminated unsaturated soils with low oxygen concentrations to facilitate aerobic microbial biodegradation. Using the supplied oxygen, the microbes oxidize the contaminants to gain energy and carbon for growth. Oxygen is typically introduced by air injection wells that push air into the subsurface. Aerobically degradable contaminants may be treated by bioventing, but fuels have received the most attention. In addition to fuels, aerobic bioventing has treated a variety of other contaminants, including non halogenated solvents such as benzene, acetone toluene and phenol, lightly halogenated solvents such as 1,2-dichloroethane, dichloromethane and chlorobenzene, and LVOCs such as some PAAs. While aerobic bioventing is useful for degrading many hydrocarbons, some chlorinated compounds are not effectively treated aerobically. Microbes may degrade these contaminants directly via anaerobic reductive dechlorination or through anaerobic co-metabolic pathways. Anaerobic reductive dechlorination is a biological mechanism typically marked by sequential removal of chlorine ions from a molecule. Microbes processing this pathway gain energy from this process. In some situations, microbes 
fortuitously degrade contaminants while gaining energy and carbon from other compounds that the coal metabolize. These organisms usually do not obtain any benefit from contaminant degradation, and the removal process is called coal metabolism. Anaerobic bioventing uses the same type of gas delivery system as aerobic bioventing, but instead of injecting air, nitrogen and electron donors, example hydrogen and carbon dioxide are used. So instead of injecting oxygen, nitrogen and electron donors such as hydrogen and carbon dioxide are used. The nitrogen displaces the soil oxygen and the electron donor gas facilitates microbial dechlorination. Cool metabolic bioventing involves injecting air into the subsurface along with a suitable gaseous substrate to promote cool metabolic reactions with the target compound. A suitable substrate should be determined in the laboratory but may include methane, ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. The delivery system is similar to other bioventing technologies and subject to many of the same limitations. Cool metabolic bioventing is applicable to contaminants such as TCA, TCA, ethylene dibromide, and dichloroethene that resists direct aerobic degradation. Soil washing. This is an established technology for the S situ separation of fine grain soils, which generally harbor most of the contamination from coarser soils. Because this is an S situ process, it requires excavation of the soils and has all the limitations imposed by excavation. Now, let me just explain the meaning of this S situ and in situ that I've been talking about. X situ means you are taking uh, your contaminant of interest from its original site to a different place to remediate it. While the in situ means you are treating it as its original place. So you don't move it, you treat it there. Soil flashing. Developing technology for treating metals and radionuclides in situ by flashing contaminated soils with solutions designed to recover the contaminants. This technology is derived from the mining industry, but has not yet been widely applied for environmental remediation of metals and radionuclides. Soil flashing involves flooding a zone of contamination with an appropriate solution to remove the contaminant from the soil. Water or liquid solution is injected or infiltrated into the area of contamination. The contaminants are mobilized by solubilization, formation of emulsions, or chemical reaction with the flashing solutions. After passing through the contamination zone, the contaminant bearing fluid is collected and brought to the surface for disposal, recirculation, or on site treatment and re injection. Soil vapor extraction. This is an in situ soil vapor extraction and it's also a remediation technology in which a vacuum is applied to induce a controlled subsurface airflow to remove volatile organic compounds and some semi-volatile organic compounds from the Vado zone to the surface for treatment. The configuration of the system usually involves attaching blowers to extraction wells, which are generally constructed with slotted polyvinyl chloride to induce airflow through the soil matrix. The contaminated air is brought to the surface and passed through a vapor or liquid separator to remove any moisture before the air is treated. Treatment is typically done by adsorption or from more concentrated waste streams by thermal oxidation systems.
Steam Injection and Extraction Steam Injection and Extraction, also known as Steam Enhanced Extraction, involves injection of steam into injection wells and the recovery of mobilized groundwater contaminants and vapor from the recovery wells. And this has demonstrated to clean up DNA pure source areas in permeable soil in both the saturated and the unsaturated zones. Steam injection and extraction may be combined with electrical heating when finer grained layers are present. In situ vitrification. In situ vitrification or ISV. It's a thermal treatment process that converts contaminated soil to stable glass and crystalline solids. And this has demonstrated to be effective in converting soil to a multi-material that solidifies upon cooling and for producing temperature that should lead to the destruction or mobilization of DNA PL compounds. There are two methods for producing heat for melting the contaminated soil. The older method uses electrodes and electrical resistance to vitrify materials, while the emerging technique uses plasma arc technology. In situ vitrification is unique among the thermal technologies in that the temperatures used will vitrify soil. The stable glass that is formed by vitrification will immobilize any non-volatile contaminants that are present including metals and radioactive materials. Phytoremediation. This is a developing technology in which specially selected or engineered plant species are grown and harvested after taking up metals and radionuclides through their roots. Phytoremediation uses plants to extract degrade, contain or immobilize contaminants in soil, groundwater, and other contaminated media. Several plant species have the ability to bioaccumulate heavy metals found in the soil, and some tree species can sequester, destroy, and or ever put transpire various organic compounds. Phytoremediation has been field tested for treating a range of metals and radionuclides. It is most applicable to large areas of surface soils with low to moderate levels of contamination. Costs are low and implementation is relatively easy, but mobilization of contaminants and transport to the groundwater is a risk when certain soil amendments are used to facilitate plant uptake of the contaminants. The various mechanisms of phytoremediation can treat a wide range of contaminants, including metals, VOCs, PAHs, petroleum hydrocarbons, radionuclides, and munitions, although not all mechanisms are applicable to all contaminants. Phytoremediation may take longer than other technologies to treat a site but it has the potential to be less expensive than excavating and treating large volumes of soil ex situ. Monitored natural attenuation. Monitored natural attenuation in many often relies on intrinsic bioremediation as an important removal mechanism. Biological processes are typically implemented at low cost. Contaminants can be destroyed and often little to no residual treatment is required. However, the process requires some time and it is difficult in general to determine whether contaminants have been completely destroyed. Side contaminants most amenable to monitor natural attenuation include petroleum hydrocarbons, low molecular weight alcohols, ketones, esters, ethers, and ion and manganese. Electrokinetic separation. Electrokinetic separation is an emerging technology that relies on the application of a low intensity direct current through the soil to separate and extract heavy metals, 
radionuclides and organic contaminants from unsaturated soil, sludge and sediment. The current is applied across electrode pairs that have been implanted in the ground on each side of the contaminated soil mass. During electromigration, positively charged chemical species such as metals, ammonium ions, and some organic compounds move toward the cathode and negatively charged chemicals such as chloride, cyanide, fluoride, nitrate, and negatively charged organic species migrate toward the anode. So this is a picture of the electrokinetic separation. This is the cathode that the negative and anode the positive. Chemical leaching. Chemical leaching is one of the traditional remediation technologies used for contaminated soil remediation. And chemical leaching involves dissolution, extraction, and separation of the pollutants, crude precipitation, ions exchange, chelation or adsorption. The potentially toxic elements in soil are transferred from solid sorry are transferred from soil to liquid phase and then separated from the liquid the separated pollutants are then converted to the appropriate form before disposal or can be reinserted in the recycling circle so we are going to look at some proven cases of health risk that is the risk involved in this contamination that we've been talking all this while there are some proven cases so the first one is soil organochlorine chemicals around Bissancon in France so this work was done by Vi et al in 2011 and they worked on a study area of three electoral wards that's 170,000 inhabitants containing or surrounding the municipal solid waste incinerators or Bissancon city eastern France so some legal guidelines for incinerator emissions have not been followed at this location for example in 1997 azot gases were not maintained at sufficient temperatures allowing, allowing diozens to be emitted so the first time that the diozen concentration of an azot gas was ever measured in december 1997 it was found to be 16.3 nanogram whereas the european guide value is 0 0.1 nanogram so once emitted the diozens and its congeners that's organochlorines they are deposed in topsoil in very short time where they accumulate. Exposure pathway of organochlorines is mainly through ingestion of contaminated food. So via a tower work on epidemiology around the site and collected serum samples from people having declared non hogen lymphoma and from people having not declared any pathologies. And they found correlations or relationship between serum organochlorine concentrations and non hogen lymphoma. Then the second one is length between cadmium and lead soil pollution with nephrotoxicity in Imbilbus in Senegal. So Cabral et al. in 2015 studied the length between the population located nearby the distard of Imbebus, which is 30 kilometers from Dakar city center, where more than 395,000 tons per year of household solid waste have been received since 1970, with highly lead and cadmium concentrated soils and the fruit of the city. So blood and urine concentrations were measured for subjects living on control and exposed sites for more than five years. 
and they found that exposed subjects exhibited significantly higher cadmium and lead levels in blood and urine than the controls. But then it has already been reported that one of the major mechanisms of the toxicity of both of these metals was certainly driven by induction of oxidative stress conditions due to the overproduction of reactive oxygen species. So as a result of this excessive production of reactive oxygen species in exposed subjects, a disturbance of the antioxidant defense system as well as an occurrence of lipid peroxidation were evidenced. Furthermore, changes in several sensitive and specific markets of nephrotoxicity clearly suggested the occurrence of early signs of impaired renal function for the discharge neighboring population. Regardless to these results, reactive oxygen species generation following low to moderate environmental exposure to lead or cadmium could be a possible mechanism of genotoxicity. Regarding the contribution of soil contamination to population diseases, these case studies should be considered with caution since, as already explained previously, exposure and human health risk assessment are case-by-case -case approaches. So in a widespread goal, more data on the contribution of other media on the population, the time and duration of exposure, genetic behavior, and on the presence of other kinds of contaminants, types and concentrations would be needed. Conclusion We say soil and water contamination is a result of many activities and experiments done by mankind. Industrial waste such as harmful gases and chemicals, agric pesticides, fertilizers and insecticides are the most common causes of soil pollution. The others are ignorant towards soil management and related systems, unfavorable and harmful irrigation practices, improper septic system and management and maintenance of the same, leakages from sanitary sewage. No remediation technique when applied in single is able to properly achieve the decontamination. Thus, combination of strategies is highly recommended. Thank you once again for having time to listen and watch this lecture. Do well to subscribe to my channel for future videos. Thank you.